everybody so glad that you are here with us today. For those of you joining with us online, we are so glad that you're here today as well. Come on in, everybody. If you can stand, we're going to sing some songs together. And as you can see, the team is a little bit smaller on stage today due to spring break and some other breaks. Uh, so that means that you are going to have to sing extra loud with us today. You at home as well. So hope that you are prepared. Stand up and let's sing and worship together. So before we keep going with worship today, I want to remind you guys of a couple of quick things. Uh, number one is that there is a connection card sitting in the seat in front of you, and we would love for you to take a second and fill that thing out, especially if you are a guest with us today. We would love for you to take a second and fill that thing out. If you're joining with us online today, we would also love for you to take a second. Go to our website. There is an online connection card there. You can fill that thing out as well, but we just want to be able to stay connected with you here at Pursuit Church, let you know what's going on. We're not going to call it hassle. You show up at your door at midnight, anything like that. But we do want to be able to let you know everything that's going on. And if you have a prayer request or, or there are some things on the back of that card that you would like more 
in, you have some interest in, like more information about, go ahead and take a second and fill that thing out. Second thing I want to let you guys know about is, is that April the 16th, what was that date? Half of you are paying attention. Half of you are already thinking about lunch. I will make this sermon an hour and a half. <laughs> April 16th. April 16th is uh, the day before Easter and also the day that we are going to have our Easter fun day complete with egg hunt, candy, all of that kind of stuff. And so we're going to start sharing that online. It's going to be at Pratt Park at noon. We're going to give out free food. I hope that you have friends that like free food and that have uh, kids. How many of you know somebody that has a kid somewhere between the ages of 5 and 10-ish, 11-ish? How many of you have ever seen a kid before? <laughs> Still, there are some of you that are like, we're going to have a lot of fun that day, and I want you to be there, and I want you to be able to invite as many people as you possibly can to be a part of it as well, and we're going to start sharing that all over Facebook, all over social media. I would encourage you, if you're on there, to do that. Uh, invite as many people as you know. If you would like some more information about how you can help be a part of it, make sure you stick around for a few minutes after church today. Uh, Melissa, our director of family ministry, she's going to be out in the lobby and uh, have some sign-up sheets and give you guys a little bit more information about about what's going on with that. So we want to make that an awesome, awesome big day. Everybody got it? Yeah. April the... Yeah. Now we're talking. Also want to remind you that uh, we would encourage you to support Pursuit Church with your tithes and your offerings. Uh, make this not just something that we are stopping worship to do, but this is actually a part of our worship, a part of our opportunity to, to respond to God with love and generosity. And if you're here in the room with us today, there is a basket in the back of the room. And uh, if you're joining with us online or you're here in the room with us, uh, you can always go to PursuitChurch.life and you can give your secure, easy donation that way. But make this a part of your life. You won't regret it. Uh, let's take a second and let's pray before we jump back into worship today. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to be able to be in your presence today. And Father, we don't want to take it for granted. And so God, I pray that in the midst of everything that's going on in this world right now, that you would quiet our hearts, that you would help us to be able to see you, hear you clearly today. God, that we would be able to put aside the distractions, thinking about what was ahead or looking forward to what's next in our lives. But instead, God, we would just be able to center our hearts on you today. That as we open your word in a few moments, that you would speak to us, that you would pull us in, that you would help us to recognize you are here and near, and that we would respond with love and worship today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you're able, stand with us. We're going to continue to sing and worship.
moment that I wake up until I raise my head, I will see the good.
We're going to take a second. We're not going to roll the video yet. There we go. <laughs> we're going to take a second and spend some time in prayer. Um, had a conversation. I was thinking about all of the people that we've been praying for and had several people lose loved ones over the last several weeks. And um, we've had a lot of people just in need of prayer and and as I was thinking through this last night at like nine o'clock I, I got a random phone call from a Montgomery number and I thought anytime somebody from that area code calls me I, I have to pick it up right like if it was an 800 number I'd be like nope but local I'm like okay let, let's check it out and and it was somebody asking for for prayer and something very specific uh somebody that we've been praying for for a long time uh, named Shane, who's in the hospital awaiting a new liver. And, and I thought that I, it would be amazing today if I could have one of his kids who are here with us today. Come on up, Bishop. You're my buddy here today. He's going to come up, and he's actually going to help me. He wants to pray for his dad, and he wants you guys to join with us in praying for his dad, who's in desperate need of a new liver today and has been for months, very sick, still in the hospital. And... Uh, Bishop's going to pray for us, and not just for his dad, but he's going to pray for a lot of people who are sick and hurting today. And I want you guys, if you can stand with us, just reach out a hand. And I, I just want you to pray. And if you've got some people on your heart today that just need prayer, maybe it's you. <laughs> maybe you're on your heart today because you just need prayer. Maybe you know somebody that's hurting. Maybe you are the one that's hurting. But let's just take a few moments. Let's center our hearts around Jesus, and let's pray. Pray for us today. Uh, dear Lord, Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this wonderful day you've given us, dear Lord. Um, I want to thank you for the many blessings, we, blessings dear Lord. Um, I want to pray for everyone who's here today. I want to pray that they would heal from an act for Alpha Sweet Church, dear Lord. Um, I just want to pray for all the sick, cho sick ones, dear Lord, and I just want to pray for them in general, dear Lord, and I want to, and I want to pray for Everyone who's helped out, dear Lord, who is not in need, dear Lord, I just want to thank you for all the blessings you've given us, dear Lord. Um, I just want to thank you for all that you've done, dear Lord. Um, I, I just want to thank you in general for just being me, dear Lord, and want you to forgive all of our sins, dear Lord, and all the things we are. In your name, amen. And Father, we also want to just pray specifically today for, for Shane who's sitting in a hospital right now, joining with us live actually at the moment. And I, I just pray right now, we pray that you would bring healing into Bishop's dad. God, that you would provide this new liver. God, that it would be miraculous, that we would see healing in his life. And for those this week, over the last two weeks, who have lost loved ones, we pray for a divine peace and comfort that can only come from you. God, for those right now who, who are raising their hands to say, you know what, I'm the one that's hurting today. I'm the one. Maybe it's something financial. Maybe it's something emotional. Maybe it's something physical. But, but God, they just need your presence and your power in their life today. God, I pray for that for them today. God, I pray that as we open your word here, that we would be centered around your presence. We would recognize that you are here with us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You
you guys can go ahead and take a seat. Thanks, buddy. All right, so before we jump into the message today, I want to remind you about Easter again that's coming up in how many weeks? Three weeks from today. That's absolutely insane. Uh, let me just tell you a little bit more about that weekend. Uh, first of all, Friday, which is Good Friday, beginning at 7 o'clock, we're going to have this room. Uh, we're going to have some, some music playing. We're going to have communion. And if you want to stop by, you and your family, you as an individual, whatever, any time between 7 and 8.30 on Good Friday, uh, just to take some time to reflect upon the cross. We'll have some videos playing. We'll have some soft music in the room. And uh, a couple of us will be here, and we will serve you communion, uh, the body which was broken for you, the, the juice or the, the wine, the, the blood that was shed for you. Uh, and it would just be an incredible time for you and your family to be able to reflect upon the cross and what it means. And so that happens on Good Friday, April 15th, anytime between 7 and 8.30. I'll remind you a couple more times because half of you didn't get that. Uh, then, I, as I mentioned before, uh, Easter Fun Day, which is going to be April 16th, but you don't want to miss Easter Fun Day uh, at Pratt Park. Free food, if nothing else, that'll get you there. And uh, invite as many people to be a part of that as you can. And then, obviously, April 17th, Sunday morning, we are launching into two services on Easter Sunday. There's going to be a 9.15 and at 1045, and so if you're like, I absolutely hate this idea, I don't want anything to change, that's great. Nothing has to change for you. You can just show up at 1045 like you always do. Or let's be more realistic. You can show up at 1048 like you always do. <laughs> that's fine. Or 1103, whatever. Um, but if, if, if we are serious about reaching our community for Jesus, and we are, by the way, we want to do everything that we can possibly do to do that. And so this gives us incredible opportunity to be able to have options for people to attend. Uh, maybe you've got some friends that work on Sunday afternoons, and they're like, yeah, I just can't get up and do that in time. You can say, well, you know what? we got a 9.15 now. Come with me. You may even have to sacrifice and show up early yourself to be here, although 9.15 is not early. Let's just call it what it is. But you can be here with them. It's going to be an incredible opportunity. It'll, it'll make this room that is sometimes a little bit crowded. And in a COVID world, there are some people that are not as comfortable being in crowded rooms. We want to honor that. Although I'm going to be really honest with you. My prayer is that by this time next year, I'm having to tell you about the third service that we've launched because both of them are so full that people are scared to show up. Does that make sense? That was the moment that you all stood to your feet and applauded in my head. But one of you is barely even clapping after I mentioned it. So we're going to have to get some more excitement in the room today. And so that happens in just three weeks. Invite everybody to know in your seat and the seat beside you is a card, an invite card. That's not inviting you. You're supposed to take that with you and invite people that you know. Everybody got it? Also, if you're on social media, it's going everywhere. The, the graphic that says Easter at Pursuit Church, go ahead and share that with as many people as you know. And it's going to be an exciting day. Don't do anything crazy like go out of town, okay? Today, we are in week two of a series called Crazy Faith. And somebody came up to me earlier and said, what do you mean crazy faith? That's just normal faith. To which I, I, I'm thinking, I'm glad that somebody finally said that because the whole idea of this series is that in order for us to have true faith right now, it's going to appear a bit crazy to the rest of the world. And that's what this idea of crazy faith comes in. And Scott kicked us off last week. And today I want to talk to you about one of the most famous passages in all of Scripture. If, even if you're not a church person, you have heard of this passage of Scripture, I promise you. And you, you guys want to know something fun? I don't think I have ever 
preached on this one time in my life, even though it's one of the most famous passages of Scripture of all. So this could like epically fail today, but I hope that it won't. We're going to talk about a guy by the name of David, who was an Old Testament king, and uh, just this, not just a king, before he was a king, he was a poet, a, a, a writer, songsmith, he was a, a warrior, he was a lot of different things, a shepherd, and this is one of his most famous stories. Now, here's what I need for you to do for me today. This will be easier for some than the others. I, I, I need you just to let your mind go blank about this story. I need you just to kind of forget everything that you think you know about what happens, and let's try to approach it with fresh eyes, a fresh heart, a fresh mind. Can we do that? Sure. A couple of you can, sure. We're going to try anyway. So uh, let me try to set the scene up for you a little bit. The year, well, it, it's somewhere in the 11th century B.C. time frame, a long time ago, and David is growing up in a very violent part of the world, in a very violent time. It's still a very violent part of the world in some ways, and it's still a very violent time, but this was really, really, really violent. And it was a different type of violent. You know, when you start thinking about modern warfare, like the whole idea is that you want to destroy your enemy from as great a distance as you possibly can so as to not to put yourself in harm's way. Well, in ancient warfare, it wasn't quite like that. In ancient warfare, they did have archers, but most of the battle was, guess what? Face to face. It was close. You could literally see the eyes of your opponent as you're holding your shield, your sword, your spear. You could see, you could almost smell what they had for breakfast that day, right? Chick-fil-A biscuits probably. And you could see what was going on. And, and, and the thing is, is you were right up close. And, and, and listen, Hollywood has tried to show us what that would be like with movies like Braveheart and Gladiator, Right? They've tried to, they, they've glorified the heroes, and, and they've tried to show us what that's like, but even on their best day, no Hollywood director could prepare you for what warfare would have been like in the ancient world. They would not have been able to capture the noises, the sounds of the battle. They wouldn't have been able to capture the smells, the fear of everything that was going on around them. And that's the world that David grew up in, and that's what David is going to walk into today, this ancient warfare. And, and the, I don't know if you guys realize this, but, but like, oftentimes you might not even know that you had been wounded until well after the battle was over. Like, unless it like completely took you out, you may have been cut or, or pierced, and you might not have found out about it for a few more hours because the adrenaline rush was so strong that you couldn't tell if it was your enemy's blood or your blood. And the reality is, is that when you did get back, if they were able to stop the bleeding, chances are you would die of an infection several days later. And I don't know if you didn't see this in Braveheart, thank goodness, but the, a lot of the people, a lot of the soldiers would often fight completely naked. They would just have their armor on. Thank goodness that wasn't in Gladiator, right? And, and the idea is that they didn't understand germs the way that we understand germs, but they knew that if a piece of their clothing was pierced, through and it went into their body and they couldn't get it out that the chances are that they were going to die or at least lose a limb and if you were in battle and all of your fellow soldiers decided to get scared and run away and they left you there guess what you were certainly going to die because your enemy would surround you and there would be nothing you could do and if you did fall on the battlefield before they could even come get you the birds the animals would come and eat at your carcass. Welcome to Pursuit Church. I'm so glad you're here today. <laughs> Normally, I try to start off with something really funny, but today I wanted to take you for just a moment into the world of David so that you could understand what he is about to walk into. If you have your Bible, I would love for you to turn over to 1 Samuel chapter 17. Famous story, and it goes something like this. Now the Philistines, that's going to be our enemies of the, the day. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Soko in Judah. They pitched camp at Ephes Demim between Soko and Ezekiah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, you ever heard of him, came out from the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits in a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. 
On his legs, he wore bronze greaves, and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and its iron point weighed 600 shekels, and his shield bearer went ahead of him. So just a quick time out to make sure that you're all aware of what's happening here. So there's a battle that's about to happen. The Philistines have approached Israel, and they say, we want some of this land, this land that God promised you. We want it. We're going to take it over, and there's nothing you can do about it. And so this guy by the name of Goliath, well, well first of all, there's this one hill over here that Israel is on, and there's this hill over here that the Philistines are on, and there's this valley in between. And this guy, Goliath, who, according to Scripture, is over nine feet tall, although I've heard some people say that they may have exaggerated that, and he may have been closer to only seven feet tall. Either way, he was a giant. He was stronger than you, well, almost all of you. He might have not have been stronger than some people in the room, but he was stronger than most of you. And he couldn't, you might not have even been able to pick up the armor that he was wearing. And he had this spear that had a 15-pound tip on it, which you may say, 15 pounds isn't anything. Oh, no, no, no. Get a really long stick, put a gallon of milk on the end, and see how well you can wield it, right? It, it was heavier than that. He could literally stand behind the front line with a shield, and he could just reach over the top and just take, take them out one at a time, and they couldn't even get to him. That's the soldier, and he what, this wasn't like his first battle. He was a hardened warrior, and he comes out, and he's about to threaten the people of Israel. Check this out. It says, Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man, have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. Or maybe a better word was, we will become your slaves. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our slaves and serve us. People of Israel had been slaves before. They weren't too interested in this again. Then the Philistines said, this day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man. Let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' word, Saul and the Israelites were and dismayed and terrified. Why? Because there's a giant standing in front of them, and there's nothing they can do about it. So in this moment, being dismayed and terrified, they did what any of us would do. They they began to turn to their leader, which was a guy by the name of Saul, who in his own right was a a bit of a giant. They say he was probably 6'4", 6'5", maybe even taller. That's one of the reasons that he actually got the job as king of Israel to begin with, is that he was tall, he was strong, he looked the part. And they're thinking, okay, well... Their giant has come out and challenged, so our giant, our king, our warrior is certainly going to go out and stop him from doing this, right? Stop the humiliation. And so they said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to put our trust, our hope, our faith in Saul. And then Saul doesn't show up on the first day. It was silent. It was quiet. Then he didn't show up on the second day. Then it was silent. It was quiet. Then it got awkwardly quiet, just like that. And the people who had, all these soldiers who had put their faith and their trust in Saul, who was going to deliver them, who was going to help them, who was going to change everything and redirect the armies of the Philistines, their hope begins to fade. Their faith begins to waver because this Saul is no longer there. And this is where their story, this story from the Old Testament, and our story, your story, begin to intersect just a little bit. Because this is what we do, too. This is what they did, and this is what we do. We place our faith in what we depend on. And they were depending on Saul to bail them out. Or maybe another way of saying it is we place our, place our faith in who we depend on. They had placed their faith in Saul, and Saul was failing big time. There are a lot of things that we place our faith in today. We place our faith in people. Do people always come through for us? No! We place our faith in money. Does money always come through for us? No. No. We place our faith in our jobs. Do our jobs always come through for us? No. Never. We place our faith in the Tennessee Vols football team. Do they come through for us? (laughs) No. Never, right? And so we place our faith in a lot of things, and it just doesn't always work. And that's exactly what they've done. They placed their faith in a king who wasn't showing up, who wasn't doing what he was supposed to do. The idea is 
they weren't even supposed to have a king. You've probably heard this somewhere along the way that they were supposed to be. God had set them up to be something completely different than every other nation of the world. They were never supposed to have Saul as their king. God was supposed to be their king. As a matter of fact, he had set them up as a theocracy, which was different than everything else in the entire world. And he was going to be their God, their king, their leader. He was going to appoint judges from the different tribes of Judah. They were going to administer the law, and that was going to be the way this worked. And then other nations were going to come to Israel, and they were going to say, wow, your crops grow so well here. You've got a constant water supply. Your borders are protected, and you are thriving. And they're going to say, who is your king? And Israel's going to answer, Sir, we have no king. God is our king. And they're going to say, wait a second. Tell us who this God is. And it was going to be something completely different than the world had ever seen. But instead, this is how it goes down. There was a guy named Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 8. It says, when Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders. So Samuel was kind of a prophet, a leader of Israel. He's getting old, recognizes that he has to appoint different people to be those judges, to be those leaders in Israel. And naturally, he picked his sons. But, verse 3, his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. Thank goodness we don't have any leaders like that left in the world. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, you are old. Thanks. And your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as who? All the other nations have. In other words, God, we want to be just like everybody else, even though you said us to be different. We want to be just like everybody else. And so they set out to find themselves a king. They set out to find themselves a king. But when, verse 6, but when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord told him, listen to all the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day. This isn't the first day they've rejected me. They've been rejecting me over and over again for years. Forsaking and serving other gods, so they're doing it to you now. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. And so, tell them the king's going to tax them. Tell them the king's going to draft their sons for war. Tell them the king's going to take their land and take their money and build a palace with it and see if they still want a king. And so Samuel did. They're like, yeah, we still want a king. So Saul becomes king. And now Saul has disappeared. When the Israelite army needed him the most, he is nowhere to be found, won't come face the giant. Everybody's sad because they've placed their faith in the wrong place. Enter David. David who was 15 years old, didn't even have a driver's license yet. His parents had to drive him there, right? They had just let him get an Instagram account. He couldn't even take pictures yet. He shows up to this battle taking some care packages that he had brought from home for his older brothers who were in battle, and he takes them there, and he recognizes something. He says, nobody's fighting, and it doesn't look like anybody has been fighting for a long time. What are we doing? And he goes to the front lines, and he wants to see for himself what's going on. And he sees Goliath, and he hears these threats. And he says, what are we going to do about this? And David, in this moment, he actually asks two really awesome questions. The first question is this, found in verse 25. Oh, I'm sorry, verse 11, just to remind you where the people of Israel are. This is where the army of Israelite had left off in verse 11. On hearing, oh, never mind, we are going to go to verse 26. They're terrified, just to be clear. There we go. They're still dismayed. They're still terrified. Then verse 26, David asked one of his questions. The first question that he asked is this. So David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? To which ev all the other soldiers were like, huh, we hadn't even thought about the fact that this is like a disgrace to our nation. We haven't even thought about the fact that something might happen for the guy who does this. Then he asks a second question, which is amazing. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the who? I want you to hold on to that thought for just a second. But here's the idea, that this uncircumcised Philistine. In other words, David says, he is not under the protection of God. He's not under the covenant of God. We are. Why are you so scared of him? And so Saul, at this point, he begins to think about it. He, he, he begins to hear these rumors that there might be somebody in camp who's ready to take on the giant. And then in walks in David. 
five foot five, 120 pounds, 15 years old, probably doesn't even lift, just wimp. Saul looks at him, oh great, this is, this is what we've got? And then David, as Saul's about ready to dismiss him, David says, wait a second, I want you to know something first. I may just be a shepherd, I may only be 15, 16 years old, but I want you to know that one day, as when I was a shepherd, a, a lion came and grabbed one of my sheep. And I, all the other shepherds in that moment, they would have just ran away with the other sheep and protected themselves. But I went after the lion, and I killed the lion with my hands. And then it wasn't long after that that a bear did the same thing. And I killed the bear with my hands. And that has special meaning to us because we had our own bear attack moment a couple years ago. And by bear attack moment, I mean it crossed 30 feet in front of us. But... I feel that. I know my truth. I feel that. And so David says, I can do this. Goliath. Well, matter, matter of fact, this is the way that he says it in verse 36. A. He says, your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because, because he's stronger, right? No. Because he's going to be wearing Saul's armor, right? No. Because, why? Because he lived his life with an assumption that none of the rest of them lived their life with. He lived his life with this belief, with this idea that none of the other, with this crazy faith that none of the other men in this army had. He says that he is going to kill this Philistine because he has defiled the armies of the who? I want you to understand something. Before David showed up to this encampment, Every time they talked about, and you can even read back through, every time they talked about the army, it was the army of Israel. It was the army of Saul. And David shows up, and he starts calling it the army of the living God. And it changed everything. Because he, didn't, he recognized that this is not the army protecting Israel. This is not Saul's army. This is a covenant that God made between him and Israel. This is the army of the living God. And David lived his life with an assumption that changed the whole course of the nation. We may be reading a different history if David hadn't shown up this day with this assumption. Now, I know that you have probably been told that you should not assume things. I won't tell you why you shouldn't assume things. You probably already know. But David showed up with this assumption, and I want to give you permission today to assume something. You're going to assume this in your life, and if you assume this like David did, your life is going to be drastically different. If you assume this, and you believe it, and you truly live it out, your life is going to change, your community is going to change, your family is going to change, your church is going to change. You guys want to hear the assumption? Are you sure you're ready for it? Because only one of you said yes. This assumption, I'm telling you, is what made David stand five foot five before a nine foot giant. Are you sure you want to hear what this assumption is that you could live your life with too? Yes. Okay, if you're ready, calm down. If you're ready, this is the assumption that David lived his life with. It's going to change your life. The man or woman whose faith is in the Lord need not fear anything. Even when there's something to be afraid of. Was Goliath something to be afraid of? Yeah. Yeah. Think, think somebody like me, just taller, you know, really strong, just taller. Two of me standing on top of each other. There was something to be afraid of, but put that back up. But the man or woman whose faith is in the Lord need not fear, even when there's something to be afraid of. What if you lived your life with that assumption in everything that you found yourself facing? When you're facing down that diagnosis and you don't know how things are going to turn out, what if you said, you know what, even though there's something to be afraid of, the man or woman whose faith is in the Lord need not fear, and you lived your life with that assumption that God is fighting for you. What if when you're facing that impossible thing that God has asked you to do, instead of saying, I just, just don't see how to do that, I don't see how it's going to work, you said, you know what, I see that impossible thing in front of me, but instead of losing hope, I'm going to believe that the man or woman whose faith is in the Lord need not fear, even when there's something to be afraid of. What if you lived your life with that kind of crazy faith assumption? What would change? 
everything would change. And everything did change for David in this day. Matter of fact, David wouldn't just do this during the battles. He lived his whole life with this assumption. He lived his whole life believing that that was true. And he wrote about it later in life. He actually kind of summed it up in a song. He summed it up in this poem in Psalm 25. It says this. It says, in you, Lord my God, I put my trust. I trust in you. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are my God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. What if you lived your life believing that was true? And every giant that you encounter, every mountain that stands in front of you, every deep ocean that you have to cross, what if you believe that God is for me, not against me? And what if you had the faith to believe that you had nothing to be afraid of because God is with you. What would change in your life? The answer is everything. And here's the reality. What happens next, you probably know the story, but I'll tell you how it turns out anyway. What happens next is that David goes down into the valley and he stands in front of Goliath. And you could probably hear the laughter from the Philistine hill. Ha <laughs> ha, look at that. They're sending out a kid. They're going to be our slaves, right? And you hear the crying from the Israel side. <laughs> Why are we sending out a kid? We're going to be their slaves. And then David stares down Goliath and he says, you're not fighting me. You're fighting the armies of the living God. And I have nothing to fear because he is with me. And he said, I'm going to strike you down and the birds of the air and the beasts of the fields are going to feast on your carcass. And he strikes Goliath down in that moment. And then the people of the Philistine army, they, they decide instead of becoming slaves, they're going to run. And what does Israel do? They chase them down and they slaughter them all day long. The Bible's fun, by the way. You should read the Old Testament. It's good stuff. Ancient warfare. All because David showed up with an assumption that there's no giant that's too big for the armies of the living God. When God is fighting for you, Whatever giant you are facing, it is not too much. If you have that kind of faith, a crazy faith that d doesn't make sense in this world, right? In this world, it says that when you're facing something difficult, a giant, a mountain that's in your way, you figure out something else. But David says, no, you live with the assumption that God is for you. And, and you have this faith. You know, but the reality is, is I, I believe we have a bit of a, a faith crisis on our hands, not in the world. That is a given, but in the church, we have a faith crisis. We're not believing that this is the God who he says he is. And instead of having a crazy, audacious faith, we have, Scott introduced us to it last week, he called it a convenient faith, convenient store type faith, where we say, you know what, we will honor God when it's convenient for us, right? When there's nothing else going on, then I'll, I, I'll have faith in you, God. Well, that's not real faith. That won't do anything in your life. I would add a few more. We also have a, a consumer-based faith. You know what a consumer is, right? It's you, you go to the store, you pick out what you want, and you don't pick the other parts up because you don't want them, right? And, and, and that's not faith. That's Walmart. We don't need to live our life that way. If you live a consumer-based faith and you take the parts you want and you leave the other parts, what kind of faith is that? Not a faith that will change your life. It's not a faith that will break down giants in front of you. We also could talk about a cultural faith that's based on the, the faith that the world around us, we, we let it creep in instead of having the true faith in Jesus. And the last one I would say is a, make sure I get it right, conditional faith. We say, God, I, I promise to follow you and trust you with everything, but just don't. And then you fill in the blank. Don't ask me to give financially because, man, I, just don't, I don't want to do that. Don't ask me to be generous. Don't ask me to do something crazy like go and serve in Africa or something. Or don't ask me to do something even crazier than that, like go down and serve with our kids. Right? Don't ask me. I was hoping you'd laugh at that. One of you got it. Good. Don't ask me to do something crazy because I, my faith has conditions. But let me tell you something. Convenient, cultural, conditional, and 
con- consumer faith. They don't break down giants in front of you. Crazy faith in God does. A, cra- a faith that seems crazy to the entire world, but it's exactly what God has called us to. That's the assumption that David lived his life with. And if you live your life with the assumption that the man or woman whose faith is in the Lord need not fear, I promise you, your family will change, your life will change, and you will see the giants in front of you. Even if they don't go down, you're going to recognize that God is with you. Now, one more thought as we get ready to to close this out. If you could stand with me. I'm going to have us say it together. Just stand up with me. I know that we've been standing a lot today, but you got a few more seconds in you. I want you so much to have this kind of faith, this kind of bold faith crazy faith that changes the world. I want you to have it so much. And so I'm going to teach you just a a quick little prayer that I want you to memorize. Matter of fact, I give you permission to take out your phone if you need to. If you can't memorize these next 10 words, take out your phone, take a picture of the screen because I want us to pray this prayer. And it's what David came to the end of his life and said, this is what matters. This is what I believe. And this is the prayer. It simply reads this. In you, Lord my God, I put my trust, my faith is in you all day long. Matter of fact, let's, let's read that together. Ready? In you, Lord my God, I put my trust, my faith is in you all day long. Come on, let's do it one more time like we mean it. In you, Lord my God, I put my trust, my faith is in you all day long. Believe that. Live that out. And just see what God does in your life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word today. God, thank you that you've called us to something that you've called us to be different. To be set apart, to to look different, to act different, to, to live different than the rest of the world. And to the world, this may appear crazy, but in reality, this is the faith that you've asked us to have. And we want to live our life today with the assumption that you are for us and that when we stand before giants when we stand before mountains that we have nothing to fear because our faith and our trust is in you all day long God I pray that for every single one of us here today for those joining online that you would just instill that into our heart and soul that you would imprint that onto our minds and that we would not just forget it when we walk out these doors but God we would live it every day And that it would change our lives. God, we thank you again. We love you. And in you, we put our trust all day long. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys have a great Sunday. We'll see you guys back next week for part three of our series, Crazy Faith. You don't want to miss it, I promise you. We'll see you guys then.